Hey, thanks for clicking in. We are so glad you chose to watch this video today. Around here, we have new videos uploaded each and every single week. So be sure to hit the subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you watch this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Check out our YouTube description to find out how you can do just that. As you're watching, you may also feel led to sow into our ministry. Feel free to use any of the methods you see on your screen to give today. In this season, your giving is going towards all of the many outreaches we have going on throughout the month. I hope that this message blesses you. I know it's going to be awesome. So let's check it out. How many know of at least one person that just has a tendency of kind of violating your personal space? You know, they, they, they ask the wrong things, they can say the wrong things, and they're, they're, they're really bad at realizing that there are some things that are just personal. And, and as you get older, you learn that it's okay to tell people it's personal. You know, now there are some people in your life that you get permission to hold you accountable. And I, I've, I've heard Pastor Tony Evans talk about this before, that every person should have three types of people in your life. You should have a Timothy, you should have a Barnabas, and you should have a Paul. What, 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 what are they? Paul is the mentor. Paul's the person that holds you accountable. The Bible says you have many teachers, but not many fathers. Paul is that guy that when he asks a question, you, you share the truth. Barnabas is your encourager, that's your peer that keeps pressing you and, and, and checks you a little bit if they see you getting off course. And Timothy is that young person that is watching you and studying you and, and seeing how you move and watching your eyes when the opposite sex walks by and watching how you treat your wife and watching how you treat your husband and watching how you treat people and really Mentor -e or mentees are the best form of accountability because they are watching everything you do. But God puts people in our lives like Paul who can get in our personal space, but everybody else has no business getting in your personal space. I've been to churches where people will prophesy to you in the bathroom and ask you personal questions in the bathroom. You live in holy. It's none of your business. Are you living holy? I would meet wives and husbands that would challenge single people. You're not having sex, are you? The Lord showed me you're having too much sex. And then when I was single, I'd step back and say, well, you know what the Lord showed me? You and your wife aren't having enough. <laughs> Both is sin. <laughs> but people have a way of crossing the line into areas that is really none of their business. Your personal life is your personal life. It is not your neighbor's business. And I think with age, you get more comfortable telling people to stay in their lane. And for me, I learned this at a very young age. I, I grew up, you know, you all know my story if you've been coming. I boxed throughout my whole childhood. You know, I trained. My, all my boxing trainers were, were devout Muslims in the nation of Islam. And there's this one story I shared years ago how I was in the boxing gym. And my trainer who raised me as a father figure at Umar Boxing on Fulton Avenue. One time he was telling a joke to somebody across the room and I was jump roping and I heard it and it was funny and I started laughing. He came up out of nowhere and punched me in my chest and said, what are you laughing at? And I said, the joke was funny. And he said, that was my joke. That was not intended for you. Mind your business. Because one day you may hear somebody saying something mean about you. And it was just one of those lessons, and I think I was like 13 or 14 at the time, and it was one of those lessons that stuck with me throughout my whole life, and that was stay out of people's business. It's personal. Unless they invite you in, stay out of their business. And the Bible makes it clear that our walk is supposed to be personal. It's not supposed to involve everybody. This is what throws people off because you think, because you got saved, your husband's supposed to be in church with you. 
and your wife is supposed to be in church with you and the kids are supposed to be on their knees praying every single night without complaining. And what you don't realize is, yes, God makes a promise to you personally that he'll get them, but your walk is personal. The Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Not everybody else's. Work out your salvation. Stop getting in other people's business. Sometimes spouses will come and say, well, you know, he just don't like to pray with me every night. And I think a good marriage to pray together every night. And my response is, you probably don't want to hear what he would have to say. He's probably asking for the grace to stay with you. She's probably asking the Lord to forgive her for the guy she stared at earlier that day. There's some things that just have to be personal. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray with people and stay, you know, in the loop with the Lord with one another. No, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying you got to get to the place where it is okay for there to be seasons, or even if it was the Lord's will for your life, for it to be you and God. Work out, work out, like going to the gym. You have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to take this thing serious and stop making it about everybody else. He says this, for it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do his perfect will. That means God is trying to work out of you what he's already worked in you. But if you get focused on everybody else, God cannot work effectively. So you have to be okay with coming to church alone. You have to be okay with telling your husband, you know, you don't want to tithe, it's okay. I can't not tell you what to do with your paycheck, but as for me and my house, as for me and what I make, everything goes to the Lord because it is God working out something in me. And the last thing I want to do is stay lifting 10 pounds when God is calling me to lift a hundred pounds. Yeah. But I'll never reach my full strength if I keep Staying worried about everybody else. Say it's personal. it's personal. The scripture says, let every person be fully persuaded in their own mind in Romans 14, 6. That means it's not on anybody to push you in a direction. It's up to you to be fully persuaded. If you're not fully persuaded, you're going to be fully frustrated. And I like what he says before this in verse one. We're going somewhere. It's going to build up. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful dispos dispos dis disputations. <laughs> that means without op oppositions. So it means if somebody comes in and their walk is not where your walk is, you shouldn't put your mind or your mouth on them. Receive them. Because you were once them. So he says, receive them. Just because they're not where you are doesn't mean they're wrong with God. For one believeth he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let him, not him that is that eateth, despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. He's saying, whether you're strong or weak, whether you do this or do that, God has received them. So if God has received them, who am I to not receive them? He says, who are you that judges another man's servant? To his own master, he standeth or falleth, yea, and he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. What Paul is saying here is if God is our master, why is anybody else putting their mouth on you? 
Or why are we putting our mouth on God's people? At the end of the day, Paul says, if God wants to make them stand, he has the power to make them stand. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need my critiques or my criticisms. Truthfully, what I've learned is that when God puts somebody in your life that's frustrating you, he is putting you in a place to press and challenge your prayer life. This is why to all the single people, if you can't respect them now, don't marry them. If you feel like you got to keep coaching them now, stay away. But to all of those that said, I do, before you got saved, God is saying rather than continuously challenge him or her, you're in a place where you have to pray for them. I've seen so many relationships get wrecked because people try to parent. People try to be teachers. And God didn't ask you to be either. He asked you to love his people, not be God to his people. And I, like I said, I've seen marriages wrecked. I've seen children wrecked. I've seen church people wrecked. I've seen the lost wrecked. And now I've learned people do this for multiple reasons. I got a couple of them. Maybe you fall in this category or somebody you know falls in to one of these cat categories. But there's, there's, I call them space invaders. There, there are people that don't realize what personal space means. Space invaders. Number one, people tend to violate people's personal space or say the wrong thing simply because they're haters. And your haters will always have something to say about you. So you might as well stop trying to please them. But people will beat people down with their words because they're haters. Some people are hiders. Romans 2, 2 talks about this. Who are you that judges another person knowing that you that judges do the same things? Verse 1, that, that is. He says, you are inexcusable, old man. Whenever people are pointing the finger at you, I can promise you, there are three fingers pointing back at them. So they are hiders. They're beating you up because they don't want you or anybody else to see who they really are. So I am the accountability police, not realizing that I go home and I do things that would make your eyelids raise. But these people like to hide. There are people that are hitters. And what do I mean by that? They like to beat people down because they like to abuse people spiritually. It does something for them. It makes them feel in control. To beat you down builds them up. There are people that are hinderers. These people are strategically placed in your life by Satan to hinder your walk. Instead of letting your walk with God be organic, they constantly find things you are doing that are wrong. And the Bible says this is supposed to be a better way of life. Jesus said, my prayer and my will is that you have my joy and my joy abundantly. How is it we get saved and from day one we never have joy? It's because people take the fun out of the ride. Walking with God is supposed to be a joy-filled experience. Yeah. Yeah. But people like to hinder. Some people are high-minded. They forget where God found them. They forget that they used to be in a club. They forget that they used to drop it like it was hot. The only reason they're not doing it is because they can't pick it up no more. But they forget. They forget about that. You know, they, they judge you for what you struggle with being single. And the only reason they're not struggling with it is because their body won't let them now. And they outgrew it. And they forget what it was like to go through it. Some people are just high-minded. 
They forget what it's like when Amaris was speaking. There were some things that went over your head, but there were some things only, some things only single moms caught. Because you heard the story of somebody who's in a position either you're in or you were in and you got the kids to be adults and got through that process. And you remember those stories because it wasn't too long ago that that was you. High-minded. And lastly, just hopeless people. They don't mean to beat you down, but they say hurt people hurt people. And hopeless people want everybody around them to be hopeless. So anytime God's moving in your life, I have something negative to say. And anytime you do something wrong, I'm going to beat you down because I want you to feel how I feel. And you cannot control all of these people. They're coming into your life. And the bigger your life gets, the more categories of people come into it. But the way you safeguard yourself is by making up in your mind today that my walk is personal. Personal. And when people make their walk personal, their walk becomes a heart thing. It's a love thing just between me and God. I don't need everybody to like me. I don't need everybody to agree with me. It's between me and and God. And here's what you got to get. Heart people, they're always doing things to please God. They're not doing it for people, as Colossians says. They're not doing it for eye service. They're not doing it to get an attaboy. No, 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 no. They're doing it for the Lord because they know that if they do it for the Lord, there's a reward waiting for them. They do it from, from the heart. And you will always have heart people and opportunity slash position people in the same room, in the same circles. This is what Cain and Abel was. Cain had a position. He was the firstborn. He thought he was entitled to give God what he wanted to give God. That was an entitled mentality. Whenever we feel like we can give God what we want to give God, that's entitlement. And Cain thought, I can give God what I want to give God because I'm the firstborn. He, was, he had the position. But Abel was going after the heart. And it does not say that God ever told him what to give. It does not say that Adam and Eve taught him how to give. We assume that Adam and Eve probably taught him, but we don't know. The Bible don't talk about it, so I've learned that if the Bible doesn't talk about it, we shouldn't. But we do see that he was after the heart. And it said that God blessed his sacrifice, and he had no respect for Cain's sacrifice. And you could tell that God didn't respect Cain's sacrifice because it says his countenance was down. Whenever a person's countenance is down, it's always an indicator that God is not pleased with what they're bringing him. When God is pleased with your life, your countenance shows it. And, and because he was after the heart and Cain was after his position. You know what position did the heart? Killed it. Because if you get around position and you have a good heart, position will try to take you out. So Cain kills his brother Abel because he had the instincts to do what God wanted him to do. Heart people always have the instincts to please God. It, it's just in them. They don't know why they do it. They just start getting in and I got to do this. There's people that have come to church for 10 years and have never considered tithing. You got a girl that's been coming for a few years and she's gotten all the way in, all the way to the stage singing and telling her story. What's the difference? Instincts. I don't know why I do this. I didn't know when I started tithing that 
my car was going to get repossessed. I didn't know that I was going to lose my home in my 20s. I had no idea when I started doing that, that that was going to happen. But if I did not do that back then, I wouldn't be in a place now where tithing is easy. It's the process. Now, some on the outside would say, I wouldn't give up my car and I wouldn't give up my house. And that's why you live check to check till you die. The Bible says it like this. Having suffered a while, I will establish you. You cannot be successful without struggle. Success and struggle go hand in hand. There are people in here for the majority of your life, you have been struggling. You struggled as a teenager. You struggled in your 20s. You struggled in your 30s. You struggled in your 40s. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but God sent me to tell somebody today, the struggle's getting ready to come to an end. Your good days are around the corner. God would not put you through so much struggle unless he had so much strength getting ready to come into your life. Look at somebody and say, the struggle's coming to an end. You cannot get to a place of strength without struggle. And so hard people just have this instinct, man, I don't know why I'm going to do it. I don't know why at 19 years old, I joined the church fresh off the streets, fresh after getting a felony conviction as a minor for selling drugs. I don't know why I just got in the church and said, I'll drive the church today and all around the city. But now I look back and I know exactly what it was. I was a heart person. And I had instincts to get involved. And it was those instincts that would make God at this stage in my life now smile on me. Because heart people always have the instincts to hear. And even if they don't get it right away, they never make excuses. They always make adjustments. I'm going to start moving this around. I'm going to start moving that around. I'm going to have to let go of this for a season. Because I want God to see that my heart is for him. And when it comes to the heart, personally, I don't think anybody displayed the heart of Jesus better in the Bible than John. John was always with Jesus. John loved Jesus. John was the only one of the apostles and disciples there at the cross when Jesus was crucified. He never left Jesus' side. You read the story of the woman at the well, and a lot of times we read it as if it was just Jesus and the woman. But no man, male, would have left another male in that setting alone with a woman who had a record of sleeping around. John was right there with them. I know he was there with them because how could he write about what took place if he was absent? Jesus didn't fill him in. He was right there. He was always with Jesus. At the Last Supper, he was so close to Jesus, it says he was laying on Jesus' heart at the Last Supper. And when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, it says that Peter looked over at John and said, ask him who it is. It wasn't all of the, they went to the one who had the heart. There are seasons in your life where you need to be connected to somebody who you know lays on Jesus' heart. Ask him who it is. Now, John would go on to do amazing things after Jesus' death. He, he would plant churches. He would maintain some of Paul's churches. I went to uh, Ephesus last year, and I got a chance to, to walk the streets of Ephesus. And uh, it was an amazing archaeological site. And across the street or so from Ephesus was John, who we're talking about today, his burial spot. He's buried in Turkey, right in Ephesus. 
I also got a chance some years back to, I took a private boat ride to, uh, to Patmos. It was about 10 hours from Athens. I caught a ferry and I rode over. And this is actually the cave where the book of Revelations was written. On the island of Patmos, where John as an old man was placed. And they poured hot wax upon his skin. And his skin melted off. Because he would not deny Jesus. Because he, he loved them. He loved them. He would write five different books of the Bible. First John, second John, third John, the book of John. And he would write revelations. He would write chapters on just having the heart of God and loving people. He would say things like God is love. Those who do not love have not seen God. He knew about getting the heart of God. And it doesn't surprise me that while his skin was burned off on the island of Patmos, while he was writing Revelations, it says in Revelations 4 and 1, Behold, I saw a door open. Because heart people, not head people, not position people, heart people, will always see a door open in their bad place. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. I know a door is getting ready to open for me. They could burn my skin off, put me on a little island, and I know that as long as I have God's heartbeat inside of me, a door is going to open. Never let a situation get so bad that you say no doors are going to open. Truthfully, I've learned in my worst seasons is when I need to look to the heavens for a door to open because there's something about a bad season that makes God open up a door in your life, a window, a window to heaven in your life. When God opens a door, nobody can shut it. When God closes a door, nobody can open open it, but to every person that feels like you're in a Patmos experience, God is getting ready to open a door for you in your life. A door in your old age, John would say. When everybody thinks that the doors are closing, God is saying to someone, this is going to be your finest hour, like fine wine. You are about to do something amazing with age. Say a door is going to open. Heart people always see a door open in their life. John had God's heart. He knew Jesus' voice. I'll never forget, I remember talking about Miss Yvette and her, her son who had a uh, gone home to be with the Lord. And one day I was at Towson just talking. My back was turned, had a hoodie on and, and his name was Ian is Ian. And he stopped me and he said, pastor James, he couldn't see me or nothing. I said, Hey, what's up buddy? And I clapped him and hugged him. He said, I knew that was my pastor's voice because when you spend time with somebody, you know, their voice. And another voice, you won't follow. John knew Jesus' voice. Jesus said, the shepherd of the sheep, the sheep know his voice. John was a, she a sheep to the shepherd. And when Peter was in his bad place, as we talked about last week, remember in John 21, 7, it was... John that told Peter when Jesus was on the seashore and said, how's it working for you? It was John that said, Peter. And there it is again, the disciple who Jesus loved. He's not arrogant at all. He says, it's the Lord. And I'm so glad that Peter had John in his life because who knows how long Peter would have sank in that shame if he didn't have somebody like John to say, Jesus has come for you. He had his heart. He had his heart. And Peter would jump off the sea, off the boat into the sea and he'd get it right with God. 
Jesus would ask him around a coal lit fire three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? Peter got restored. And you know what Jesus said to him as we go forward? He says, Peter, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked wherever you wanted to walk. Because that's what youth does. And don't look at youth as a number because Peter is a 40-something-year-old man right now. And Jesus is saying, when you were young, which is like yesterday. When you were young, you went where you wanted to go. You did what you wanted to do. This is the sign of a weak Christian. A weak Christian does not do what God wants them to do. They do what they want to do. There is no garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, your will be done. It's my will always wins. Whatever I want, I do. Whoever I want to date, I date them. When I want to leave, I leave. When I want to drink, I drink. When you were young, you could live like that. But Jesus says, Peter, I'm about to speak to your destiny, your purpose. It's so big that when you are old, I love this. He says, when you're old, that means, Peter, there's going to be a lot of stuff that happens. But when you find yourself in jail cells and they're talking about killing you in Acts, go ahead and sleep between the two guards. Because I'm telling you that you're going to live to be old. And if you look in the mirror and what you're going through does not match what I said, I want you to call it a liar. To every person that has a promise, everything that does not match what is tied to your promise, God is saying it is your season to call it a liar. If singleness is not your promise, call it a liar. If divorce is not a part of your promise, call it a liar. If, if working a dead-end job is not tied to your promise, call it a liar. If drug addiction is not tied to your promise, call it a liar. If being abused is not tied to your promise, call it a liar. He says, Peter, you are going to live to be an old man. And you will stretch forth your hands. You're going to be an old man stretching. I always pray, Lord, don't let me ever stop stretching. If you keep me in this world till I'm 90, I want to keep stretching. Because the day I stop stretching is truly the day I start dying. The cancer won't kill me. The disease won't kill me. The age won't kill me. What will kill me is when I stop stretching. When I stop having a get out of the boat mentality. When I stop saying, Lord, give me a new giant to slay. When I stop saying, Lord, if you put me in front of a sea, I'm going to split it. When I stop praying big prayers like Joshua, son, stand still. When I stop stretching is when I stop, when I start dying. There are people in here dying right now and you look young. You're dying because you don't stretch. There's something about stretching that makes God want to walk with you every day. He says, Peter, you will be old and you will stretch forth your hands. Another will gird thee and carry you where you would not go. Peter, this is going to be hard for you. But when you get older, you know what you're going to have to practice. And it's a sign of growth. Submission. It's always been Peter's Achilles heel is submission. Peter, when you get older, you're not going to fight so much like you did when you were young. You're going to submit to the hands I put in your life because they are in your life to guide you to your destiny. This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken, he said unto him, follow me. Whew. He spoke to his destiny and he told him how big it was going to be. And he said, follow me. Once Peter got his heart right with God, 
God spoke to his purpose. He did not sit on the past. He spoke to his purpose and he said, Peter, follow me. Follow me hurting. Follow me broken. Follow me lonely. One day, follow me old. Follow me. And you think this would have been it, man. I'm, I'm back. Like that scene in, uh, what was it? Uh, Trading Places. When the two brothers from coming to America, or the two brothers, no, no, the two brothers from Trading Places were in coming to America, and Eddie Murphy gave them some money, and they were like, we're back. You would think Peter was having a moment like that. We're, we're back, I'm back. It's personal now. Follow me. But you know what Peter did? <sighs> then, Peter. Turning about. Why are you looking around and not looking at Jesus? The Bible says to keep our eyes on Jesus in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It says, casting off these things, these distractions, being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us put off these things. The sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Peter, why are you taking your eyes off Jesus? But isn't this what happens after a good church service? You go home and say, and what about him? Or what about her? What about my daughter? What about my son? And Peter, this is not a we moment. This was a you moment. How do you get all this classified information about your future and you're still focused on everybody else? Peter, turning about, he sees John over there and said to John, let's go backwards a little bit to 21 and 22. He looks backwards and sees John, the one who Jesus loves. The one who sat at the table and Peter said, who will betray you? That John. He says, and what shall this man do? Jesus said, if I want him to chill on the couch till I come. What is it to you? How many marriages would be changed if this was the mentality? How many families would be changed if this was the mentality? How many people serving, even in church today, would this change if you didn't worry about who else was serving and who wasn't serving? Peter, what is it to you, dude? Follow me. What he's saying is, Peter, keep it personal. Don't get distracted. Don't worry about him. If, if, if we do this thing, Peter, it's going to be so big that the world will be changed for thousands of years. Stop worrying about him, Peter. If you get so focused on him, it's going to destroy your future. And see, Peter had the position. Remember last week, Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Peter had the position. He was the leader of the team. He was the leader of the New Testament church. Everything that got done had to go through Peter. Even Paul had to get Peter to approve things. 
Peter had the position like Cain. And John, like Abel, had the heart. And what is Jesus doing? He's killing a Cain and Abel situation. Because he's seen how this story has ended before. Because position will always kill heart. And I'm glad that Jesus stepped in. Because John would go on, as I shared with you, to write books. He'd write more books than Peter wrote. He'd plant churches. He'd maintain churches. He'd be around to write revelations and hear Jesus' voice so clear about the end times. And the reason that Jesus had to step in and stop Peter there is because Jesus is going to be gone in a few days, officially ascended to heaven. And if I don't stop this now, we might never see John's destiny happening, Peter, with people like you. And to every person that God has a purpose for, you may not see it right now, but God has been stopping so many things from attacking you. Yes, John heard the words. But last I checked, words cannot kill you. John saw Peter's weapon forming. But Jesus did not let Peter's weapon prosper. And to every John in here who's really trying to just love God and have God's heart. God says, I've already done it. But you're going to see me do it more and more. And even with this thing coming on and you're going on in your life right now, God says, if you just keep my heart, I promise you this thing that is trying to stop your purpose, this thing that is trying to stop your happiness, this thing that is trying to shut you down. God says, yes, you may see it forming, but I am going to stop it before it prospers. It will not affect your purpose. It will not stop you. Be confident in this. Whatever God starts, God finishes. You don't have to finish it. You don't have to worry about people to help you finish it. When God starts something in your life, nothing can stop it. So let a sickness hit your body. Let them lead you. Let them take whatever they want to take. Let them give whatever they got to give. God says, at the end of the day, I promise you this. As long as you keep it personal, we are going to get to the finish line together. I feel like there's somebody who's battling in their walk right now. And God is saying... This is the day for the battle to stop. This is the day for your walk with Jesus to become personal. Because personal people always experience a God that fights their battles. For the battle does not belong to us, the Bible says. The battle belongs to us. To God, And when God sees that you are taking your relationship with him personal, he says, everything that attacks you, I take it personal. Yeah. So Peter, what are you worried about? I got John. You're worried about somebody who's going to eventually change the world. You're stressed out about a young man. Who before it's all said and done, he is going to outlive you and pay such a huge sacrifice to lay on my heart. He's going to have his skin burned off one day. That's the price tag of laying on my heart. Remember, it was John that said, his mother said, can, can my son John sit on your right? Or left hand side. 
Can, can, he, can he drink the cup that I drink from? It says, John said, yeah, I could do that. Because to get close to Jesus means that you have to be willing to drink your own Gethsemane cup. And no matter what happens to you in life, make up in your mind that I am going to stay connected to his heart till the day I die. It's personal. It's personal. And Peter, we're going to see this in the coming weeks. We got to get this together because as long as you keep attacking John, as long as you keep acting high-minded, Peter, as long as you continue to stay a hater, Peter, we're never going to be able to have an upper room experience because I will not come into the upper room unless you all are gathered together on one accord. And Peter, if we don't get this thing in order, you are going to hinder my next phase in changing humanity. It's so much bigger than you. And you may not be trying to change God's phase with humanity, but you could be affecting God's next phase for your family. God's next phase for your job your career, God's next phase for your community. Because until you're ready to make this thing personal, you're never going to see the doors open in your life that God is trying to open for you. Because this right here is personal. And God is trying to teach us in his final days the aftermath of the resurrection. An important principle through this little simple story. That no matter what happens in life, my people need to make their walk personal. So it's no longer about him, her, them about you remember the blind man in John 9 and they were trying to call Jesus all kinds of crazy stuff and they were saying this man does this in the name of the devil he blasphemes he's this he's that because if you're not confident in your walk and you build your confidence in what people say what people say will destroy you and the blind man says something in John 9, 25. He says, look, and I'm paraphrasing this. Whether he's crazy, whether he's a sinner, whether he's being used by the devil, I can't testify to those things. But I, I can say this. I once was blind, and now I see. And what the blind man was saying is, I know you all say what you want to say, but I'm confident enough to speak from my personal experience. Amen. It may not work for you, but it works for me. Amen. It's personal. And if the blind man didn't have that mentality, he would have messed up the moment because of what the crowd was trying to convince him to believe. Have you made your walk personal? I pray I don't ever get sick with something, you know, crazy. But I can't say this. I'm like Paul. If I ever die, don't, don't cry for me. I'll see you on the other side soon enough. We lose that mentality in today's culture because today's culture is very self-oriented. Where back in the day, man, people were like in their 30s saying, man, I can't wait to go be with Jesus. We don't talk like that no more. 
And the reason we don't talk like that no more is because we don't make our relationship personal no more. I could die tomorrow and trust me, I'm good. Because I'm going to get a chance to meet the God I've never seen, but I've always had it personal with. And to stand in his presence, the one I gave up all the pleasures of the earth for, the, the one I made up in my mind to keep myself here and keep myself there for, to stand in his presence. I gave up friends. I gave up family. I gave up opportunities for him. And to stand in his presence, the one who held me when my heart was broken, the one who caught every single tear, the one who saw what they said and said, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. To stand in his presence. Don't cry. For me. I know where I'm going. I'm excited to get there. But while I'm here, and while I'm passing through, I'm going to throw this little rock of a life at every single giant that stands in front of me that opposes my God. And as long as I'm here, I made up in my mind, my walk will always be personal. Can God get you today to cast off all the distractions that are keeping your walk from being personal. Your husband may never get where you want him to be, but it's okay because it's personal. Your wife may never get to where you want her to be, but it's okay. It's personal. The kids may never be what you wanted them to be. It's okay. It's personal. And I believe everything tied to you is supposed to be great. Like John would go on to be great. But they'll never become great if you keep nagging them. I'd rather you hear me pray out loud than hear me nag out loud. I'd rather you come into the bedroom and see me on my knees than raising my voice in the living room. Because that's how change happens. That's me taking my relationship with God personal. Is your relationship with God personal? Or are you getting caught up in all the distractions? And they're not always people. They can be bills. They can be hospital visits. Distractions. And God is saying, let's make this thing personal. And let's do life together. I was talking to Amaris in the back before she went up. And she was so nervous to share her story. Because it's a lot of pressure. And let me just say this from experience. Y'all do not make giving talks easy. I wish everybody clapped for giving like you clap when I talk about blessings and healings. And it would make it so much easier. But it's very tense in the room. Because this is what the scripture means where it says your treasure is where your heart is. Because a lot of times money brings conflict. It brings tension. Because people really don't like to hear the truth. God will never give money to somebody that prays for it. Because money is not a miracle. Money is a principle. It's a partnership with God. You come into partnership with me and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven. It's a partnership. But a lot of times we want to be preached into happiness rather than being obedient and being truly happy. But in the back, I told her, I said, when you get up there and talk, tell your story. It's your story. You don't got to be nervous. You only have to be nervous when you're telling somebody else's story. But nobody can tell your story like you tell your story. 
And all she was doing was telling everybody about and just a glimpse of her personal walk. I never heard those steps before. That was her personal walk. If I had to sit down today and one by one go to each person in here and say, it's your turn on the stage. Tell your personal story about giving. Your personal story about sacrifice. What would the story be? Would people be inspired and say, man, that's so personal, I want to do it. Or would you not be able to tell a personal story? And every season that story should change because your life gets bigger and bigger. I've got stories now that trump my stories at 19. They're still big stories, but my life has been a series of open doors. And that's what God wants to do for you. He wants your life to be a series of open doors. Like, P Peter, you're going to get old. You're going to be an old man stretching for me. You're, you're going to be submitting your life into the hands of the people I put in your life to guide you to the moment I told you about. But it'll never happen if this does not become personal. So today, in-house, online, can we make it personal? Can we, like her, say it's going to start? She didn't say it's start. Oh, I did it. I've heard those stories. That was me. I just did it. But every person's given a measure of faith. But maybe you're the person that says, okay, whatever 2% looks like, that's me. 3%, that's me. 4%, that's me. Doors keep opening. Doors keep opening. Doors keep opening. Can God get you to have a personal walk starting today and not just today but from today till the day somebody is preaching your funeral can we make this thing personal all the songs we sung today for praise and worship were all songs that had i in it the stand i stand I'm coming back to the heart of worship. I, I, I. Because today is a day of making it personal.